even when our descendants are established on near-Earth asteroids and Mars and the moons of the outer solar system and the Kuiper Comet Belt, it still won't be entirely safe. In the long run, the sun may generate stupendous X-ray and ultraviolet outbursts. The solar system will enter one of the vast interstellar clouds lurking nearby, and the planets will darken and cool. A shower of deadly comets will come roaring out of the Oort cloud, threatening civilizations on many adjacent worlds. We will recognize that a nearby star is about to become a supernova. And in the really long run, the sun, on its way to becoming a red giant star, will get bigger and brighter. The earth will begin to lose its air and water to space. The soil will char. The oceans will evaporate and boil. The rocks will vaporize. And our planet may even be swallowed up into the interior of the sun. Far from being made for us, eventually the solar system will become too dangerous for us. In the long run, putting all our eggs in a single stellar basket, no matter how reliable the solar system has been lately, may be too risky. In the long run, as Tsiolkovsky and Goddard long ago recognized, we need to leave the solar system. Such a future would, I think, naturally evolve by slow increments, even without any grand goal of interstellar travel. Here's how it might work. For safety, some communities may wish to sever their ties with the rest of humanity, uninfluenced by other societies, other ethical codes, other technological imperatives. In a time when comets and asteroids are being routinely repositioned, we will be able to populate a small world and then cut it loose. In successive generations, as this world sped outward, the Earth would fade from bright star to pale dot to invisibility. The sun would appear dimmer until it was no more than a vaguely yellow point of light lost among thousands of others. The travelers would approach interstellar night. Some such communities may be content with occasional radio and laser traffic with the old home worlds. Others, confident of the superiority of their own survival chances and wary of contamination, may try to disappear. Perhaps all contact with them will ultimately be lost, their very existence forgotten. Even the resources of a sizable asteroid or comet are finite, and eventually more resources must be sought elsewhere especially water needed for drink, for a breathable oxygen atmosphere, and for hydrogen to power fusion reactors. So in the long run, these communities must migrate from world to world with no lasting loyalty to any. We might call it pioneering or homesteading. A less sympathetic observer might describe it as sucking dry the resources of little world after little world. But there are a trillion little worlds in the Oort comet cloud. Living in small numbers on a modest stepmother world far from the sun, we will know that every scrap of food and every drop of water is dependent on the smooth operation of a far-sighted technology. But these conditions are not radically unlike those to which we are already accustomed. Digging resources out of the ground and stalking passing resources seems oddly familiar, like a forgotten memory of childhood. It is, with a few significant changes, the strategy of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. For 99.9% .9 of the tenure of humans on Earth, we lived such a life. Judging from some of the last surviving hunter-gatherers, just before they were engulfed by the present global civilization, we may have been relatively happy. 
It's the kind of life that forged us. So, after a brief, only partially successful, sedentary experiment, we may become wanderers again. More technological than last time, but even then, our technology, stone tools and fire, was our only hedge against extinction. I don't know where my train of argument ends. As more time passes, attractive new denizens of the cosmic zoo will draw us further outward, and increasingly improbable and deadly catastrophes must come to pass. The probabilities are cumulative. But as time goes on, technological species will also accrue greater and greater powers, far surpassing any we can imagine today. Perhaps if we're very skillful, lucky I think won't be enough, we will ultimately spread far from home, sailing through the starry archipelagos of the vast Milky Way galaxy. Even a modest extrapolation of our recent advances in transportation suggests that in only a few centuries we will be able to travel close to the speed of light. Perhaps this is hopelessly optimistic. Perhaps it will really take millennia or more. But unless we destroy ourselves first, we will be inventing new technologies as strange to us as Voyager might be to our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Even today, we can think of ways, clumsy, ruinously expensive, inefficient to be sure, of constructing a starship that approaches light speed. In time, the designs will become more elegant, more affordable, more efficient. The day will come when we overcome the necessity of jumping from comet to comet we will begin to soar through the light years. And, as St. Augustine said of the gods of the ancient Greeks and Romans, colonize the sky. Such descendants may be tens or hundreds of generations removed from anyone who ever lived on the surface of a planet. Their cultures will be different. Their technology is far advanced. Their language is changed their association with machine intelligence much more intimate, perhaps their very appearances markedly altered from that of their nearly mythical ancestors who first tentatively set forth in the late 20th century into the sea of space. But they will be human, at least in large part. They will be practitioners of high technology. They will have historical records despite Augustine's judgment on Lot's wife that no one who is being saved should long for what he is leaving, they will not wholly forget the earth. In modern Western society, writes the scholar Charles Lindholm, the erosion of tradition and the collapse of accepted religious belief leaves us without a telos, an end to which we strive, a sanctified notion of humanity's potential. Bereft of a sacred project, we have only a demystified image of a frail and fallible humanity no longer capable of becoming godlike." Close quote. I believe it's healthy, indeed essential, to keep our frailty and fallibility firmly in mind. And I worry about people who aspire to be godlike. But as for a long-term goal and a sacred project, there is one before us. On it, the very survival of our species depends. If we've been locked and bolted into a prison of the self, here is an escape hatch, something worthy something vastly larger than ourselves, a crucial act on behalf of humanity. Peopling other worlds unifies nations and ethnic groups, binds the generations, 
and requires us to be both smart and wise. It liberates our nature and, in part, returns us to our beginnings. Even now, this new telos is within our grasp.